Hello, I'm Lisa Van Dusen, and this is First Person. Today, I'm here with Lucy Blake of the Northern Sierra Partnership. Hello, Lucy, welcome. Can you describe what you're doing currently and why you're doing it? I'd be happy to. I am right now working as uh, president of the Northern Sierra Partnership, which is a campaign to conserve the large landscapes of the Northern Sierra, basically from Lake Tahoe up to Mount Lassen. And uh, I am, I'm, I'm kind of like a wrangler. I'm, I wrangle. We've got five organizations that have come together to work on conserving this landscape. And my job is to keep them all uh, herded up together and moving forward and advancing this campaign. It sounds like you, besides Wrangler, or if that's the, me the meta job, what, what are the different roles you play? Well, I, I've been involved uh, in many efforts over the years, but in, in this effort, uh, my job is to help with strategic planning for the effort, helping with fundraising, helping with uh, uh, finding the synergies uh, between the work of the different organizations and figuring out ways to um, bring new people to the effort and new resources to the effort so that we can um, advance conservation in this r remarkable landscape as quickly as possible while we still have the time to do so. Can you give a little historical context for this project? The five organizations I'm working with, let me just say who they are because I think it's useful to know. It's the Nature Conservancy, the Trust for Public Land, two national organizations, and then two uh, local organizations, local land trusts, the Tr Truckee Donner Land Trust that's working in the Truckee area, um, and then the, the Feather River Land Trust, which is dealing with the whole Feather River, which is the biggest um, uh, watershed in the whole Sierra Nevada, huge, huge region, from Mount Lassen, basically, down to just north of Truckee. And, um, the context is that all five organizations were working on conservation in the region and uh, successfully moving forward, but they had a sense that the pressure on the lands were increasing, the, um, the time to act on conservation was, was now, and that if they just kept operating at the scale and speed that they were operating, that they were gonna lose, that, they were gonna, that important parts of the Sierra Nevada would get converted to resort development or to um, rural residential development uh, unnecessarily just because there wasn't the capacity in the region. So the idea was let's uh, ring the alarm about the need for conservation in this important part of the Sierra. A little context on that is that a lot of people think the whole Sierra Nevada is protected. What is it if it's not protected? Interestingly enough, so uh, the Southern Sierra and the Central Sierra, 90% uh, of the land over 3,000 feet is in public ownership. So there are, if you go on a backpacking, you'll go backpacking up from Bishop into these beautiful places next to Yosemite. There, there's these wonderful wilderness areas where you can go and visit. Um, when you get to the Northern Sierra, it's 50% of the land is in public ownership over 3,000 feet. And the reason for that is interesting. It's, it's historical and it also has to do with the geography. Uh, when people were walking across the country to come to California the first time and they come to the great uh, range of the Sierra Nevada, they of course walked over the lower part of the range and the lower part of the range is in the north. So they came across the northern part of the Sierra and a lot of them settled. They found the mountains, they thought they were beautiful, and people started settling and, and claiming land. So that's part of the reason that there's more private land. Secondly, uh, the gold rush. The gold rush was, was really the epicenter of the gold rush was the northern Sierra mother load region. And so there were, the world rushed in, as we all know, and so a lot of land got claimed during that time. And then thirdly, when the railroad was built, across, the railroad builders knew they didn't want to go off the, over the highest part of the Sierra, so they came over the lower part, which was uh, Donner Summit. And those three things combined uh, meant that there was more hu a human presence in the northern Sierra than there was in the central and the southern Sierra, and less public land. If this is unusual in some fashion, what yeah. is most unusual about it in a positive sense? I think this partnership is really an unusual partnership, and it's sort of worth, I mean, I've run a lot of different organizations over the years, 
it's very rare to see uh, five separate nonprofit organizations really lining up to work together in this sort of full-bodied way. I mean, we these organizations are uh, doing planning together, strategic planning together. They're raising money together. They're executing projects together. They're thanking their supporters uh, and and recruiting supporters together. So it's a very different. It's very unusual to see nonprofits doing that, and it has made a, it's 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 really breaking new ground. I think it's been very interesting to see our the supporters of these individual organizations how pleased they are to see the organization that they've been supporting for so many years lining up with other organizations to get something done. I think people who are on the supporting these organizations are really happy to see that kind of um, commitment to results. This is really all about results and working together to get the results. It's not about any one organization um, taking all the limelight. So what drives you crazy in this process? I think the, the hardest thing in, in these kinds of collaborations is, in fact, getting everybody to line up at the same time on projects. Sometimes you'll have one partner who's really in the lead and wants to um, move the ball and is trying to bring the other ones along, but the others are maybe focused on something else. So I think getting everybody um, uh, harnessed to the wagon and pulling is, is definitely the hardest part of the job. And, um, but I think it's understandable. You know, groups, uh, they have to, they have their own organizations to run. They're trying to, they're moving this campaign. They're helping us, but they've also got their own boards, their own strategic plans. So, so it's just the distractions just of the everybody. The alignment. Yeah. The getting the alignment. The wrangling. Right, right. the wrangling, <laughs> exactly. Where do you get your inspiration? Where do you find your inspiration for doing this work? And when, you, when I talk about this work, I mean not just this project, but some of the other things you've done. Um, historically. You know, I first got involved in uh, environmental issues and conservation when I was at Brown. And I uh, took a, a course uh, in environmental science from a professor there who was both a lawyer and a PhD chemist and fascinating guy. And I became aware of the challenges that we were facing as a planet and decided at that time, that was more than 25 years ago, that I wanted to get involved in the environmental movement. And I've done a lot of different things over the years. And I think the motivation is to, to uh, address these very, very serious problems of the survival of our, of our of humankind. I mean, I don't think it's really any less than that. And I, I've been involved in different pieces of it over the years. I've been involved in the you know, business and economics side of it when I started the Sierra Business Council, which was really interesting, working only with the business community to move the dialogue and the discussion around conservation and sustainability. I want to go back to this professor. Who was the professor? Uh, it, Harold Ward. Can you picture yourself in a moment when something that was going on in that class or that you were reading in that context changed your thinking? Or was it just more you hadn't even thought about this whole world until then? I learned about conservation first through my father. My father was a really great influence on me. He was a career diplomat. And I grew up all over the world in Africa and Europe. And I was born in Tunisia. And uh, we had uh, talked about conservation and, and the environment as a family when, we were, when, I, when I was young. But when my father uh, retired from the Foreign Service, he became a full-time activist and got on the board of the Wilderness Society and wrote a paper for the EPA about rainforests. And so he was really a, a big um, inspiration for me and, and my interest in this. And I hadn't thought about going into it as a career until I met Harold Ward. And he really encouraged uh, a lot of us um, who were at Brown at that time to get involved in, in it as a career. Do you think it makes any difference that you are here? I know you could go back and forth between the Northern Sierra and, and Palo Alto. Does it make any difference, do you think, in your approach to your work that you were located here in Silicon Valley, here in Palo Alto? Silicon Valley is just a great place to work. I mean, there are so many interesting people, and you, you, you're sort of in this very, very creative environment. And it's, I think it's also a place where people, um, they, like, uh, they like upstarts. They don't mind people taking on very ambitious 
projects. And so, you know, it, it, I think if you were in Iowa and you tried to sit, tell somebody, you know, we're doing a $340 million campaign to save half of the Sierra Nevada, they'd look at you like you were insane. And in Palo Alto, if you say that, people say, wow, that's exciting. Tell me more about it. But there isn't this sense that you're trying to do something impossible. And we aren't trying to do something impossible. We're trying to do something actually very achievable. But you have to have other people who, who believe you can achieve big things. What do you wish that people were focusing on more in general? There's so many important things to focus on. I mean, clearly climate change is, I think, the, is the biggest one. As a, as a world, we need to address the issue of climate change. And, um, and I think uh, I've worked a lot on, on renewable energy and the transformation. One of the jobs I've had over the years, I was head of the Apollo Alliance working for the tr transition to a clean energy economy. I think that that transition is in progress. I think we're seeing it happen. I think we need to keep accelerating that and we need to, we need to really get behind that as a society and as, as humankind, we need to do that. Um, there are so many other issues that we also need to deal with, but if our planet collapses as a, as a life support system, it makes other issues that we're concerned about, whether it's the quality of education or I was listening to the radio show about children, the trafficking of children, which is just appalling. There are so many problems that we need to deal with, but we absolutely have to deal with our life support system or else none of these other problems are going to matter at all. What would surprise people about you? Yeah, it's so funny. When I, um, when I decided to buy this ranch, my mother was, thought I was crazy. She said, don't you have a full-time job? What would you, why would you want to own a cattle ranch? And uh, part of my motivation in, in buying the ranch, I bought it 25 years ago, was actually had to do with restoration. It was a, it was a ranch that had been, uh, it was like a horse that had been ridden hard. And this ranch had really been ridden hard. It was um, the grass, there was so little grass that it, you could find a matchstick out on the middle of this meadow because it had just been eaten down to the, to the no. roots. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I really like the idea of buying this ranch and treating it lovingly and kind of bringing it back to life to its sort of full ecological vigor. And I thought it was really important to keep the cows on the ranch as a way of um, showing how you can integrate good stewardship of the land with having uh, ungulates in there, you know, on the land. There have been ungulates grazing in meadows in the Sierra forever. There were elk, there were all kinds of animals. So there's no reason that the cow isn't the problem, the owner's the problem. And you know, if to the extent there's a problem with cows hanging out in creeks and you know, cr causing water pollution or other problems, those are problems that the owner needs to take charge of. And that's what we've done. We've, you know, we have well-behaved and well-controlled cows. Anything else you want to say? One of the most interesting jobs I had was a job, uh, an organization I launched about, whatever, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, 20 years ago, I also lose track of time, it's called the Sierra Business Council. And the idea of the Sierra Business Council was to really bring the business community together uh, as advocates for the long-term long -term regional sustainability. And I, I think the role that businesses can play in helping to transform um, society it, not the economy and society is so important. And I think that one of the things that I've learned in my career is the importance of reaching out to, um, to, to develop new allies all the time and to not think in terms of writing off categories of people, whoever they are, that it really is important to continue always to be building um, new constituencies and new allies and to reach out to people as fellow humans to bring them into whatever effort you're involved in. And so uh, I think Silicon Valley, uh, it is a very entrepreneurial place. There's a lot of really interesting people. And I guess the one thing I would say to anybody that might be listening is that I hope that as busy as they are, and we're all just impossibly busy, you know, find a way to get engaged in something that you care about and get engaged in a serious way. Find, find something where you can get involved on a board and and um, and lend your talents in a in a uh, in a deep way to that effort because y you have a lot to offer and um, there are a lot of organizations like ours that benefit from uh, those kinds of leaders.